Tennessee This Week from WATE 6 on Your Side starts now. Two more candidates for governor for you to meet, Randy Boyd and Beth Harwell, as we help you make your decision for Election Day coming up on Thursday. And it is our final chance to talk about the races, local, county, and statewide before the ballots are cast right now on Tennessee This Week. Hello everyone and welcome to Tennessee This Week. I'm Kristen Farley. We have been working for weeks to help you hear from the candidates for governor on the Democratic side. We brought you the debate between Craig Fitzhugh and Carl Dean. And while the plans for a final Republican debate did not come together, here on Tennessee This Week, you've already heard from Diane Black and Bill Lee. Now we're rounding out the four leading candidates today. We're hearing from Beth Harwell in just a moment. But first, WATE 6 on your side anchor Bill Williams sat down earlier with Randy Boyd to see where he stands on a lot of the issues. Randy Boyd, thank you so much for joining us right now. Appreciate you taking some time. I know it's a very busy time for you right now. It's great to be here and great to be back in Knoxville, Tennessee, my hometown. I bet I say you've been all over the state yes. right now campaigning. And speaking of the campaign, uh, this is crunch time right now. Uh, the polls right now have you pretty much kind of sitting second right behind Diane Black. What do mm. you what do you attribute to that? What's your yeah. game plan right now? I mean, it's a close race yeah. right now, so it, I'd say it's a close race. Most of the polls that we've seen have okay. me in the lead, okay. but it's a small lead. Sure. So we wake up every day assuming that I need to go out and get another hundred votes. And for me, uh, it's about retail politics. Mm -hmm. I'm going out talking to people at polls, uh, at, at uh, cafes in the morning, everywhere that I can just meet people. Sure. Yeah, and I know you were just talking. You're going to be f traveling all across. I mean, this yeah. is crunch time. I mean, it's yep. almost time for, for Election Day. So That's right. Yeah, so you've got to get out there. So the last 95 hours of the campaign, mm -hmm. we're going to be doing a 95-hour uh, tour. Okay. We're going to be going from uh, place to place, starting in the west, going all the way to the east, uh, maybe sleeping an hour or two in between, but working 24-7 for 95 hours straight. Okay, I tell you what, a lot of people have been making comment here as of late. You can't turn on the TV now without seeing an ad. So let's talk about the ads here for just a moment. A lot of uh, uh, attack ads, seems like everything's kind of going back and forth. Unfortunately, that's kind of looks like where the, the campaigns have been going here as of late. Uh, we've seen some of the ads, and you're seeing up uh, up here right now between you and Diane Black. Also, Bill Lee has become a target as well. Uh, we noticed that one of your ads, though, uh, recently uh, seemed to, uh, well, take up uh, a situation, uh, take up some of Diane Black's talking points against Bill Lee over his contributions to Democrat Megan Berry and for not supporting President Trump in 2016. We asked you about this during a campaign stop. I want to listen to your answer here first. Okay. So all of our ads are there to uh, help promote our positive aspects and then to share any contrast that we have with any of our competitors. Did you say what, the, what kind of the differences were in policy with you and Bill Lee? You were, I guess, kind of Kind of trying to highlight yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure which ad you're talking about, so I, don't, I can't say. I think it was one that recently came out, yeah. but I didn't know if you can speak to it. Yeah, not, not really. Actually, I don't really watch the ads or, or, or do, spend a lot of time with the ads. I'm spending most of my time out talking to voters and out in our communities. So let me ask you this then. I mean, and you, you've been asked about this before, too, about the, the, the campaign ads right now. Are you comfortable with, with, with these ads, uh, especially the, the ones that have been coming out here recently? It seems like been flying back and forth. Yeah, no, frankly, I wish the ads could all stay mm -hmm. positive. You know, at the, uh, about five weeks ago, when we, uh, the, before the negative ads started, mm -hmm. we had about a five-point lead. Now it's gotten a little smaller. But I, I wish we were constantly just uh, promoting our positive attributes and the things that we, we uh, support. When in the uh, interview there, I mentioned that I don't watch TV. Right. I apologize since I'm on a TV show <laughs> right now. This is not good for your business, but I, I actually uh, do get through this campaign. We don't watch TV. We don't uh, follow the social media. I just go out and talk to real people out in the streets. and. It, it helps you keep uh, sane and, and, and stay very positive because the sure. people in the street are, are very positive. So if you don't see the ads, you don't watch the ads, then, then, then what is the process then for, for them eventually yeah. making air? Who is approving oh, them? Well, How so does this I, work? I, do I do have a team that does okay. actually craft the ads. And I do approve the, the, the scripts and, okay. and, and, what, and obviously I'm starring in our ads. So mm -hmm. I, don't know all, I do know all of our ads. And the, with the uh, contrast ads, we always want to say factual. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that we're highlighting the differences uh, between myself and the other candidates and making sure that people are, fam are familiar with positions that maybe other candidates have taken. But okay. um, if it was up to me, it would be 100% uh, positive ads just about all the things that we stand for and the things that we want to accomplish. Okay, so again, you don't see them, but you do see the scripts as you kind oh, of yeah. put them through going through. Yeah. Okay, uh, the debates. <clears throat> Obviously, we had one in West Tennessee, Middle Tennessee. One was scheduled here for East Tennessee, your home court, your backyard, yeah. but you decided that, that you were not going to take part in this one. I think a, a scheduling conflict, but kind of what went through the process deciding right. not to be here. And is it really fair to some of the East Tennessee voters not to be able to see 
oh. uh, the four of you debating on stage. Well, they, they could have watched the other 18 sure. debates. So it, th when we first started the campaign, I w we talked about maybe having six debates. Mm -hmm. um, then it became 10. Uh, as of uh, three weeks ago, we have done 18 debates. We've had okay. two on education, three on health. We've had some on uh, child poverty. We've had them for the mm -hmm. Tennessee Bar Association, the Tennessee Medical Association. You name it, there's been a debate. Most of them have been either uh, on statewide television or live streamed. Anybody that wants to go back and find out an, uh, an answer to an issue can go back over those 18 debates, most of which were an hour and a half long. Sure. I was the only one that was in every single one of those debates. I had not missed a single debate. But now, we were, uh, this particular debate was 10 days after voting had already started. Okay. And we wanted to get out and spend the rest of our time with direct contact with the voters. Okay. Let me ask you this. Uh, you're campaigning on your record of bringing jobs to Tennessee. You're a businessman. Uh, you're, the, you're the commissioner, obviously, of the economic and community development, uh, plus creating the jobs with your business That's as right. well. Uh, obviously, this can be a challenge uh, at times. So, you know, U.S. manufacturing, a lot of it we have seen has gone overseas. Uh, we were looking on your website. We noticed an 05, a factory in China. Now, is that something uh, that you maybe would look to bring jobs back here? Or yeah. will those jobs stay in China? What, what, what are your thoughts there? Because yeah. we did notice on your website that right. there we, is a center we, there in China. Yeah, we, we, we manufacture products sure. all around the world and sell them all around the world. And we want to make sure that we're manufacturing where it's the most efficient to provide the best value for our customers. And we suggest that to any, any manufacturer. Okay. Tennessee is a great place for advanced manufacturing. Over the last six years, advanced manufacturing has grown by over 30% in our state. Mm -hmm. When I was commissioner, the job uh, average pay, the, the jobs that we brought in, went from $20 an hour to $22 an hour. So as governor, what I want to do is continue to focus on bringing the highest paying jobs to the state of Tennessee. Okay. We can't make everything. I mean, we don't grow bananas. We can't do everything in Tennessee, but we can bring the high paying, high quality jobs to Tennessee, and that's what Tennesseans are looking for. Okay. Uh, assuming you become governor, and of course uh, the race is continuing, what do you bring to the legislature? for them to work on first. How do you get them on board, considering uh, maybe you don't have some of that, that, that insight, uh, the, those insiders, I should say, you know, the, the well, relationships? Uh, actually, I, would, I disagree. Okay. Uh, when I was Commissioner of Economic and Community Development uh, in, for two years, and then prior to that, the year that I helped create the Tennessee Promise mm -hmm. and the Drive to 55, I got to know a lot of the legislators very well. We, and so we've got a, a really strong relationship. My plan in working with them is to be very collaborative and very transparent. In November, on November 8th, the day after the election, I plan on starting to work. And one of the first things we do is start bringing leadership from the legislature together to start crafting what the policies will be. Some of the big things that I want to work on next mm -hmm. year. Yeah, because I, mean, I was going to ask you, what, what's yeah. really out of the gate? What yeah, would you work day, on? Day one, there's a, several big things. My day one is going to be a very, it's going to be like a 72-hour day. But day one, well, one of the big things we'll start on is a, a major uh, reinvestment in career and technical education. Okay. Working to bring our career and technical uh, uh, colleges and community colleges creating satellite campuses on the high schools so every student in the state of Tennessee can graduate, has the opportunity at least, to graduate from high school with not just a high school diploma, but a certificate and a job ready skill. Not every kid needs to go to a four year college, but every kid needs to have the ability to be able to walk out and get a great job. Second big thing that we're gonna do on, on day one is declare a state of emergency against the opioid crisis mm -hmm. and uh, appoint a chief epidemic officer. We've got a major uh, effort around prevention and the governor has done a good job of getting started on that path but we also need to make a major uh, effort around recovery. People going to jail with uh, addiction issues aren't getting better. We need to put, create facilities where they can actually get the treatment that they need so mm -hmm. that they can actually get on with their lives. And the good news is it's seven times cheaper to put them in a place where they can get recovery or get the proper treatment than it is to send them to a jail. De so there's a couple of the really big things we start off with. And it definitely has been, both of those have been definitely huge, huge subjects, huge topics here of discussion as of late. Let me ask you this real quick then. You're looking at the, the entire field right now. What sets you apart? We see the ads, a yeah. lot of people, you know, if you break them down, a lot of you are saying the exact same thing, but what sets you yeah. apart from everybody else then? So I think I have the right experience and the right vision. On the right experience, I'm the only one that's an entrepreneur. I started my mm -hmm. own business from scratch, created over 735 jobs, uh, over 4,600 products. So I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a businessman, I'm a private uh, sector job creator. I'm an innovator in education. I started something called the Drive to 55 and the Tennessee Promise. I'm the only one with executive branch experience in the state government, um, and not just experience, but getting some dramatic things done, like re recruiting 50,000 jobs to our state and creating the Governor's Rural Task Force. All right, Randy Boyd, we appreciate it. Best of luck to you. you bet. Thank, Thank you, sir. you. Appreciate you. Yep. All right, everyone, that was Randy Boyd on the issues. Next up, Beth Harwell. Stay with us. You're watching Tennessee This Week on WATE 6 on your side.
Welcome back to Tennessee this week. Everyone you have heard now from Diane Black, Bill Lee, Randy Boyd, and now we're going to bring you our final candidate in the Republican primary for governor. I had the chance to sit down with speaker of the Tennessee House, Beth Harwell. All right, Beth Harwell, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Good to be with you. Glad to have you in. Let's talk a little bit about uh, you and your fellow Republicans. We're supposed to be taking the stage for debate here in East Tennessee. That kind of all fell apart. Right. You had debates in other parts of the state. Mm -hmm. um, were you disappointed that it wasn't able to happen here in East Tennessee? I was. I was looking forward to it. I actually enjoy the debates, and uh, uh, we've been through quite a few, though. I have to be honest. We've been, I think, like 18 debates now. So mm -hmm. I can understand, uh, since early voting had already been completed and 9.30 at night, I can understand why some of the other candidates were a little hesitant. Let's talk a little bit about some recent data that came out. It, it puts you in third place, mm -hmm. and that's about a quarter of the likely GOP voters undecided mm -hmm. at this point. Oh, excuse me, that would be fourth place according mm -hmm. to that poll. Um, we've been seeing more of your ads as we get closer to the end of this cycle right. here. How do you feel about how your campaign is rolled out? Are you happy with the way things are going? Very much so. I think we're peaking at just the right time. I think a lot of money has been spent and not a lot of decisions have been made. As you pointed out, mm -hmm. the biggest voters are the undecided voters and I, I'm hopeful they'll fall my way. A lot of people talking uh, about your ad campaign mm -hmm. involving the baby <laughs> element of your uh, competitors mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how that came about and how you feel about that. Why that was important for you to put that out there. Well, I think I'm one of the few that's running a completely positive campaign. We showed a little humor there. Uh, the reality is I am the candidate that has not just promises, but performance. Uh, I have the experience and am ready to serve our great state. Uh, let's talk about, you know, you led the state house, just as you said, uh, you know what this process is like when the legislative mm -hmm. session kicks off. So assuming you win this race, mm -hmm. what do you want the first thing that you tackle be? Well, you know, we take it for granted as Tennesseans, but we shouldn't. The fact that we have a balanced budget every year. Number one priority will be that we keep our financial house in order. Uh, we are proud to be the third lowest tax state in the nation, the lowest debt state in the nation. That didn't happen by accident. I put a lot of energy into that every year. A, a lot of people have looked at some of your campaign ads and said balancing the state budget is part of state law, but you tout that as a big accomplishment saying other people can't always do that. Right, because we haven't always done it here in the state of Tennessee. A lot of times we have ra rated our rainy day fund. We've increased taxes in times past. Uh, we've gone into deficit spending uh, and none of which we are doing now. We are actually balancing our budget. We are not spending non reoccurring money on reoccurring expenses. So I'm very proud of the fiscal responsibility that I've demonstrated. Let's talk about taxes a little bit. Talk about the gas tax that just passed. And if I'm not mistaken, you helped support that here is that is a tax increase something that a, a lot of Republicans say they're not going to get behind. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that to the voters out there who say uh, Beth Harwell is running on no increasing taxes, well, but this just happened? Right. I will explain a couple things. Number one, it was not my first proposal. It was Governor Haslam's proposal. I actually fought it. I thought it would be a better thing not to raise or lower taxes, but instead to take when you buy a car in the state of Tennessee, that car sales tax money goes in the general fund. I would have liked to earmarked it to the Department of Transportation. But I will say we had not raised the gas taxes in 28 years in this state. There's not much you can buy at the same price you paid 28 years ago. Cars are much more efficient than they ever have been before. And we now have 962 road projects going on across our state. 17% of our bridges were listed as structurally deficient. You can't run a state that way. We know that good education and good roads equals jobs for our state. Would you support a tax increase for something else out there right now? No. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. All right, let's talk a little bit about health care. What about Medicaid expansion or Insure Tennessee? Would you try either of those again? You know, I think that with the new president, uh, the last time it was tried under Governor Haslam was President Barack Obama. It did not receive the support in the legislature. Um, I think if we do, we should go back up to President Trump, who has a much more open mind of giving states freedom to design their own program. I believe he believes that domestic issues belong at the state level where they can be more efficiently and effectively run. I know if we could cut out from some of the regulations at the federal level, we could design a health care plan that would work for Tennessee. Do you have a specific plan maybe in the back of your mind? Because there's people out there right now, Tennesseans, who are lacking health care coverage, who are greatly concerned about what's around the corner. Right. We did, the legislature set up a task force under my leadership mm -hmm. called the Three Star Task Force. We actually designed a program that would curtail some of the costs, but expand to more people, especially those with behavioral health needs.
Um, Tennessee schools, it, we've made a lot of progress, still lagging behind some other states right now, but again, a lot of progress. At the same time, TN testing, TN ready testing has been kind of a mess. Yes. Where do you stand on this? So many people are going, someone needs to be accountable for this. Right. And that's why I was pleased this last year that we said the Tennessee ready testing does not count mm -hmm. for teachers or for students. You know, teachers, I talk to teachers on a regular basis, they've endorsed my candidacy. They want a credible, fair, useful testing system. They're not afraid of accountability. They just want to be useful. We failed them in all three categories, so we have to do a better job, and we will try. How do we overhaul this? This is not an easy solution because we have to have teachers be held accountable, but students need some sort of standardized testing. Most people would agree on that, but how do we overhaul this? Right. I think one of the most important things we did, you know, when Barack Obama tried to push Common Core down our throat, mm -hmm. we did what all good Tennesseans do. We rolled up our sleeves and we wrote our own higher Tennessee standards, and it's paying off. Our children are some of the fastest improving in both math and science. So going forward, I think we need more input from teachers and our school systems to design a program that's unique for Tennessee and will measure the results. Let's talk a little bit about immigration. Uh, we recently had a raid here in East Tennessee uh, of a plant. As of the taping of this episode, the plant owners still have not been charged with anything during uh, or after this raid. Do you think that employers need to be a part of immigration reform, the wo those who employ illegal immigrants. Absolutely, and in the state of Tennessee, they are to e-verify. They are to verify the status of someone before they hire them. And I'm very proud in the state of Tennessee that we have outlawed sanctuary cities. We will never have them in this state. I think pub the public needs that in order to feel safe. Isn't e-verify, though, only for companies of a certain size, of 50 over, and over 50 and above? Yes. Would you support that for companies of all sizes? Absolutely. I mean, there is a cost curtail, but perhaps we can help these smaller companies meet that. But we do need to make sure that we're not giving people that are here illegally jobs. All right, Beth, real quickly, you know, as we said, 25% of the voters at the taping not decided yes. yet. So what would you say to them right now to separate you from the rest of the field? What makes you stand out? Well, I believe I have a working knowledge of state government. I have been in a leadership capacity in this state as Speaker of the House during our boldest and most successful initiatives of reform. I don't know about you, but there's no other state in the nation I'd rather live in than Tennessee. And it's because we have our fiscal house in order and we are a conservative state. And I'm proud that I have a good working relationship with the legislature, all very necessary in order to become a good governor. All right, Beth Harwell, thank you so very much. Thank you. All right, everyone, our panel of pundits gets one last say before election day coming up. Stay with us. You're watching Tennessee This Week on WATE 6 on your side. All right, everyone, welcome back to Tennessee This Week. It's time to hear from our panel of pundits today. Joining us right now, we have WATE 6 on your side healthcare analyst Craig Griffith and WATE 6 on your side political contributor Courtney Piper. Good to see both of you. Glad to be Thank here. You. All right, so we have officially heard on this show from all four leading Republican candidates for governor. Craig, let's start with you. What are your predictions and what, are you, what is your takeaway from all of these interviews? Well, uh, they're scrambling to get those 25 percent undecided because that's going to decide the vote. Uh, the polls that we've seen, they're all within the experimental error of each other for the most part. So how those break down is going to be how determines the vote. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with Randy Boyd versus uh, Carl Dean in the November election. Uh, I think Randy will probably win East Tennessee. Uh, Harwell, Black, and Lee will split Middle Tennessee. So the, really the vote will lie both in the ring counties of Memphis and the rural areas. And I think that Boyd has done a much more better job at the retail politics of getting out there and shaking the hands, and especially in those rural areas, his bus tour, his run across the state, things like that. Uh, so that's, that's the way I'm going now. They're all, you know, I think that we all would have appreciated a more cerebral type of campaign. But as I said before on this program, those, that doesn't generate enthusiasm amongst the voters. We're going to talk about the campaign and the, and the nature and the tone of it in a minute. But Courtney, what are your thoughts on all four of these candidates and, and any predictions that you might want to make? You know, last week I said that my political spidey sense was sensing this Bill Lee surge similar to Spangler with our sheriff race in Knox County. And I'm still getting that sense primarily because voters that I talk to in East Tennessee that are primarily independent seem to be incredibly put off by Randy Boyd's ads and this image of himself that he's presented that seems to be in a very stark contrast to the man we all know and love in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, you know, my, I like to say my husband is my quintessential independent voter, so he's my, my focus group of one sometimes. <laughs> and we were sitting watching TV the other night and he said, you know what, I'm going to vote for Billy. 
And I said, well, why are you going to do that? And he went back on sort of this image he's seen of Randy Boyd that contradicts with everything that he knows. And I said, well, you know, I want you to think about that. Maybe that vote for Bill Lee could be a vote for Diane Black. And how does that make you feel? And so, you know, if voters are going to be thinking that way, like us politicos think, that's what's giving me this sense that perhaps Bill Lee is going to, to surge ahead of Randy Boyd. But, you know, in East Tennessee, it's really difficult for us to perhaps have a clear picture of this race because we all know and love Randy Boyd so much and the contributions that he's made to this community. But a lot of people are saying those commercials and those ads do look incredibly different. Again, we're going to talk about ads coming up in a minute, but let's talk about the Democrats here for a moment. Carl Dean, Craig Fitzhugh, uh, the Democratic primary for governor. There was a debate that we aired uh, about a week and a half ago. What is your takeaway from all of this on the Democratic side, Courtney? We have two excellent candidates here in the Democratic primary, which is really, really great for Tennesseans because, again, we're going to be giving Tennesseans a choice to make during the general election. Carl Dean, Craig Fitzhugh, both incredible men. Carl Dean at this point seems to just have the financial resources and therefore more of the mobility to get his voters to the poll. We'll see what happens on election day, but Carl Dean seems to just kind of have those resources that really outweigh Craig's message to the voters. Let's talk a little bit, and, and Craig, you just talked about, and you already made your prediction on Carl Dean a moment ago, <laughs> but in terms of finding a difference between the candidates, a lot of people saying after the um, Democratic debate that we hosted that there really wasn't a stark difference between the two. Is there anything you can pinpoint? Well. There isn't, uh, and nor is there a stark difference amongst any of the Republican candidates, uh, aside from very late in the game, Beth Harwell's come out for in support of medical cannabis, which I think if, if someone had done that earlier as a difference maker, it might have been a, a something to uh, uh, run on. But I don't think there's much difference amongst the, the Democratic uh, uh, candidates. Uh, I think they're all, you know, in, uh, pro-choice. They're they're all want insure Tennessee or some sort of Medicaid expansion, and so I think there's not really that much difference. I saw a poll that showed that Dean was substantially ahead in Davidson County, 67% uh, to like 35%. And so I think if he's going to carry that area of that Democratic stronghold that solidly, it's going to be very difficult for Fitchu to to break through that. Well, let's go to move on to another big race we're watching: the Republican primary for the District Two congressional seat. We know the big names. We're talking Tim Burchett and we're also talking Matlock here, but we've also seen Jason Emmert on TV and we've seen lots of Ashley uh, Niklos in the last couple of weeks as well. A few other names on the ballot. What are you guys taking away from this race? Well, this has been one of the more nastier races in East Tennessee history. I remember a year ago I said that if Duncan doesn't run or if Duncan runs, it'll be a civil war uh, in the Republican Party for this entire uh, election. And, and indeed, it's turned out to be that way. And I think it's turned off more voters than it has brought voters out to support one particular candidate. So, Who's going to benefit from the way this is going to shake out, Who, yeah. from the carved out vote, so to speak? Well, if you want my prediction, I need to tell everybody that, as they remember on the show, mm -hmm. Tim Burchett is my next door neighbor and I have contributed to his campaign. So uh, I think Tim is going to uh, wind up winning this. Uh, um, I don't think that uh, Matlock has moved the needle in terms of his support areas outside of his hometown. I, but I think in the other counties, Tim has worked real hard out there and I think that he'll carry the day. Courtney? Jimmy Matlock made a critical error in the direction of his negative campaign. He went way below the belt with Tim Burchett and he did some things that in my opinion were completely unfair and dishonest and that's really going to uh, blow back on him in a very negative way and cost him votes. So to that extent I think you know Burchett has has the advantage here but I have to say I'm surprised to see Jason Emmerich and Ashley Niklos having t TV ads. Um, I thought this was really going to be a battle royale between Matlock and Burchett, and that was the only television ads we were going to see. But, you know, here comes Jason Emmerich building a wall and Ashley with her things. Yep. And um, it, it was really surprising to see that. Well, come I think out. a Let's lot of that came out, though, uh, way too late because yeah. it was almost at the same time as early voting started. So, and you know that early voting is the, the biggest precinct in the election now. So, uh, if they timed their campaign better, of course, they're, they're political. Well, Emmerich isn't a political novelist, but certainly Ashley is. And, All right, we only have 45 seconds left. We need mm -hmm. to get on to the overall negativity of the ads, both in the governor's race and this race. Were you guys surprised? I said in my 14 years here, these might be two of the most negative campaigns I've seen. What do you guys think? 
Well, as I said earlier, it's, a, it's been a civil war. And people are really going over the top. And I have de detected, you know, like Courtney's talked to her, so I've detected a real negative feedback from it. And yeah. I think the people that are doing the uh, the real negative, you know, calling someone a liberal who's a lifelong conservative, you know, people understand that and they've rejected that. Courtney? It's qu it is completely crazy and unlike anything I've ever seen. It's, it's madness. Yeah, pe people have told me they've stopped watching TV because they can't stand watching the ads right now. So. After no, I'm Thursday. still watching you. Oh, thank you. I <laughs> yeah. appreciate that. And now she yeah, should, now, Brad. Now we, got the, now we got the really All right. big poll. All right. <laughs> you know, it's the only poll that counts. We need to leave it there. Remember, everyone, Election Day is Thursday. We have tons of resources to help you cast your ballot and to make the process as smooth as possible. And all of our political coverage on our website, WATE.com. And, of course, we hope you'll join us next Sunday at noon as we sort out the aftermath on Tennessee This Week. The views of guests and panelists of this program are their own and not necessarily those of WATE 6 on your side or Next Star Broadcasting Incorporated.